I want to welcome you all back for the last set of shop talks for 2021. I'm Elizabeth Rodini, the Andrew High School Arts Director at the American Academy in Rome. And I'm really happy uh, and, and somewhat sad also to be introducing our closing act for the season. Uh, as usual, two speakers, a scholar and an artist who will each speak for 25 minutes with questions for both and discussion following the second talk. And we'll start tonight with Matthew Ellis, who holds the Paul Mellon, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Rome Prize in Modern Italian Studies and is professor in the Department of History at Sarah Lawrence College, where he holds the Christian A. Johnson Endeavor Foundation Chair in Middle Eastern Studies and International Affairs. He did his graduate work in history at Princeton University and also holds a master's degree in Modern Middle Eastern Studies from Oxford. Matt's research embodies the broadening perspective of many of our academic fields and of the American Academy itself. It's centered not on Italy, but on the Middle East and North Africa, and his interest in borders and their malleability, their instability, and even their fictitiousness is particularly timely and relevant. His recent publications include Mobility and Modern Italian Citizenship, Lessons from Italy's Colonial Past, just out in the Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Mobility and the Myth of Middle Eastern Borders in 2019 in Contemporanea, and his 2018 monograph, Desert Borderlands, The Making of Modern Egypt and Libya, published by Stanford University Press in 2018. Desert Borderlands, to quote one reviewer, challenges the notion that the borders of modern Egypt and its territory as a whole were imposed from the center by the state, privileging instead the experiences and politics of Bedouins for whom these lands were not marginal, but rather were the center of their existence. Matt's project in Rome extends some of these similar themes to the Italian colonial empire, in particular to Libya and Libyans. Over his career, Matt has won awards from the Social Science Research Council, the American Cent Research Center in Egypt, and from Harvard University for an intensive summer school in Ottoman Turkish. Matt's linguistic skills extend to modern Turkish, Arabic, French, Spanish, and of course now Italian. Fellow students in his Italian course confirm that he makes language learning look way too easy, and I know we all envy that. Matt's talk is titled Mobility and Modern Italian Citizenship, Lessons from Italy's Colonial Past. After Matt, we will hear from Steve Parker, the Cynthia Hazen Polsky and Leon Polsky Rome Prize winner in design. Steve is a composer and musician based in Austin, Texas, and is a lecturer in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts at UT San Antonio, as well as curator of sound space at the university's Blanton Museum of Art. Steve's CV is chock full of interesting material and impressive achievements. To simply focus on the awards he won in 2020, in addition to the Rome Prize, there is the Ashurst Art Prize out of the UK, prizes from the NEA, New Music USA, Foundation for Contemporary Arts, Mid-America Arts Alliance Artistic Innovations, and the REA Charitable Trust. And there's more. Um, I counted at least three NEA awards, for example. Steve also exhibits and performs widely from Marfa, Texas to Berlin, from the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas to Lincoln Center in New York City, from Portugal to Korea and now to Rome. And he'll be part of a set of musical installations and performances we're putting together here at the Academy with his fellow Rome Prize winners later in May. But you are especially lucky if you live in the San Antonio Austin area because Steve is particularly loyal to his neighborhood where his works have included just for example, Symphony number no. I-35, as in Interstate 35, um, which is a participatory work for 10-part automobile choir, and Batman from 2016 for chorus, conch shells, funnel horns, live audio feed of bats, echolocation devices, and percussion. So Steve is full of surprises, and I'm looking forward to his talk tonight, Performative Listening. With that, we're gonna to turn to Matt. And Matt, I turn it over to you to share your screen. Okay. Um, can you all see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. Great. So thank you for that generous introduction, Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the American Academy in Rome for making this fellowship possible despite the very difficult circumstances. 
and to thank all of you for your friendship and inspiration these past months. It has been especially wonderful for me to be living in community with so many vibrant scholars of visual culture in the built environment. Through my many conversations with all of you, my work has been completely transformed and, and deeply enriched, so thank you. Last month on April 6th, new uh, Italian premier Mario Draghi made his first official state visit to Libya. Now, inaugural state visits are symbolic. You might remember this one, President Trump's first um, official state visit as president of, of the United States was to Saudi Arabia, which set a certain kind of tone for his foreign policy over the next four years. A similar thing might be argued in retrospect, we'll see, uh, about Draghi's visits to Libya. Draghi himself um, sort of flagged this as a symbolic occasion. He, he said during this press conference, and I quote, the visit itself demonstrates the importance of a historic link between the two countries and that this is a unique moment to rebuild an ancient friendship. At the same time, Draghi took the opportunity to praise the Libyan Coast Guard for its role in countering human trafficking across the Mediterranean. In doing so, Draghi was of course invoking the so-called migration crisis that really dates back to the early 2000s but started to peak and make international headlines following the Arab Spring of 2011. The focal point for um, those following Italy and for the Italian government has been the small island of Lampedusa, located here in the Mediterranean, sort of between Tunisia, Malta, and Sicily, where many, many migrants have been intercepted and detained over the years. Of course, I think it's important to point out that migration crisis is a bit of a misnomer. In fact, only a very small minority of all undocumented or unauthorized entrants to Italy have arrived on Italy's shores this way. Between, 20, between 2000 and 2006, for example, 70% of, un, of unauthorized entrants actually um, are what are known as overstayers. They came on legitimate visas, but then overstayed the terms of those visas, whereas only around 10% of people actually arrived by sea. However, I want to actually suggest that when Draghi flagged the Mediterranean migration issue during this very symbolic first state visit to Libya, he's actually missing the point because um, he obscured a much deeper history of Italian connectivity across the Mediterranean with Libya and North Africa, a history that hinges on an understanding of the modern Italian nation as fundamentally mobile and diasporic. An interesting example of this history comes from the immediate post-World War II era. This is a context actually of a true European refugee crisis. In this period, there were around 15 to 20 million Europeans who were displaced and needed to be repatriated. Now in the Italian context, what's interesting here is that the imperial possessions, which I'll be talking about in this talk, were in flux, the future was uncertain. And it turns out that there were actually many Italian settlers who had been living in Libya but were evacuated during the World War II campaign in North Africa. And at this time, in sort of the mid forties, they want desperately to return to their homes in Italian Libya. So they start to organize in Sicily and leaving from the Sicilian port of Syracuse, they organize a series of secret departures by boat absconding into the night, trying to achieve their shores, their homes along the shores of uh, Libya. I don't think I need to underscore the irony here too much but this is a moment where you have Italians absconding by night on boats, making illicit crossings across the Mediterranean Sea to return to Africa. This seeming paradox, I think, raises some key questions. Questions with respect to what it meant to be Italian at this period, and what might it mean for Italy to decolonize, given that the fascist empire overseas had been built to endure. As a historian, I am drawn to stories like these, stories that are overlooked, forgotten, or willfully shunted to the margins in the service of some larger narrative or political project. These ideas have led me directly to the study of nations and nationalism. Nations are really the ideal site for examining, questioning, and deconstructing the large, alluring, and yet often deceptive stories that we tell ourselves. What gets obscured or buried in these typically feel-good stories? What goes missing from national narratives and national mythology? Whose voices are silenced? These are some of the questions that I took up in my first book project that Elizabeth introduced, Desert Borderlands. 
just quickly here, you know, in, in Egypt, there's this sort of age old mythology of timeless continuity and territorial in in integrity of the Egyptian state. And I wanted to sort of look more closely at that and try to challenge some of these myths. And I did so by looking at the Western borderland and trying to document a much more complex, fraught and contingent process by which this swath of the Eastern Sahara became territorialized as a modern uh, nation state as part of modern Egypt. But Italy too, I think, has a national narrative that is similarly ripe for some historical contextualization. Let's take, for example, the history of Italian unification, the Risorgimento. Now, the Risorgimento is generally seen as a triumphant process of unification of the Italian people of the peninsula under a strong central government um, led by the Savoy monarchy. But it seems to be the case that really before 1860, it was only a tiny minority of people, avid nationalists, who seriously believed that Italy should be called a nation and that it warranted a, unita a unitary state of its own. Some of this is also borne out in the complicated linguistic picture of the Italian peninsula. Right? I'm sure I don't need to tell you that regional identity in Italy is very, very strong and that linguistic identity ties into that. We know that around 1860, only about 2.5% of the population that would become Italian understood Italian, Italian being at this stage, really a literary Tuscan dialect since the Renaissance that only the educated elite would speak. Another staggering statistic is um, from a survey taken in 1980. At this time, apparently 50% of Italians still preferred to speak dialects as their first language. So old habits die hard, regional identity dies hard in Italy. In the rest of the talk, I'd like to turn now to my main theme, which is that yet another critical way for the historian to complicate and challenge Italy's national self-understanding and nationalist ideology is to eliminate two key but often overlooked aspects of the Italian past. Namely, first, Italy's experience as an overseas colonial empire in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th. And then second, the notion that the very emergence of the modern Italian nation state cannot be divorced from new ever expansive experiences of mobility in the same period. I think it's important to revisit the history of empire in Italy in part because the country has been so slow to reckon with the weight of its colonial past. There has been a marked persistence of certain myths, for example, the myth of Italiani brava gente, this idea that Italy, Italians were good colonizers as opposed to Britain and France, that they were not racist like their German Nazi counterparts. There's also been a willfully imposed amnesia about some colonial atrocities that were committed by Italians in Libya and the Eastern Horn of Africa. And this sort of suppression or denial of the past has actually been fostered by political elites and formal, former colonial officials who were very invested in whitewashing this history. Revisionist work on Italian empire only really started to emerge in the late 80s. And it was really um, bent on trying to enfold Italian imperial history more firmly within Italian national history. And this is sort of the vein in which I'm working in my research here. So that's empire. I think it's also important to rethink um, Italian history of mobility. I mean, after all, I think it's hard to argue against the idea that Italianness in the first decades after unification was forged as much through diaspora as it was through territorial or social integration of the peninsula. Um, for example, between 1880 and 1915, 13 million Italians emigrated overseas. And, apparent, and according to another statistic, between 1876 and 1976, 26 to 27 million Italians um, emigrated. So um, Italy as a mobile and diaspor diasporic nation seems to be sort of a, a firm conclusion that we can draw. Now, Libya is an important site here, given its centrality in the Italian colonial system, especially in the fascist area. Libya became known or was often referred to as La Corta Sponda or the Fourth Shore. And after 1938, the Libyan uh, colony was actually formally annexed to become part of Italy. So traveling to Libya in that period would have been traveling within Italy's national borders. So before I, I get into what this uh, research actually looks like, I wanna talk a little bit about my research process. So though ostensibly it might seem that this project is about North Africa, I want to emphasize that this is very much a project about Italianness, 
and by necessity, my archives are here in Rome. We think a lot about Rome as an imperial city in antiquity, but it was also actively being refashioned as an imperial city by Mussolini in the 20s and 30s. I feel like a lot of you know this story, and this is reflected, for example, in the built environments, sites like EUR, the Foro Italico, the grand imperial thoroughfares that were um, put in place by the, the Forum or, or St. Peter's. But Rome was also becoming a new imperial city at this time, or a renewed imperial city, because it had contained sites for imperial knowledge creation government archives, and the very ministries that were making decisions in the metropole um, over the lives of people in the colonies. Now, my time here has been a little bit difficult because of the pandemic. You could say I've had sort of a little bit of archive fever, although maybe not in the sense that Derrida made. But slowly but surely, I've been able to get into the two main archives that I wanted to look at. So the top right is the Central State Archives down in EUR, and the bottom left is the historical archive of the foreign ministry. Now, both, ironically, are located in fascist buildings. And it's the, the um, foreign ministry archive that has been especially important to me because it's really the epicenter of documentation on Italy's overseas expansion and its experience of colonial governance. And fittingly enough, it's located right next to the Foro Italico. So now I'd like to move on to give just a little bit of uh, an overview of Italian colonial expansion. Just like emigration to the Americas in the late 19th century, overseas expansion was a feature of Italian nationhood almost from the very beginning. In fact, the two are inextricably linked. Within the first two decades of full unification, once Rome was on board in 1870, Italy had already claimed over several overseas possessions in the Eastern Horn of Africa, Eritrea, and then in 1908, Somalia. Why? Why did Italy want these overseas possessions? Well, it turns out a big part of the logic was to counter the flows of, of emigration, those millions of people moving to America or South America. Um, the Italian government wanted to create new spaces for Italian settlement, new ways to generate wealth for the Italian peninsula, but closer to home. So um, this process continued with the occupation of Libya in 1911 and 1912, when Italy went to war against the Ottoman Empire. Now, this is interesting and ironic, I think, because this was actually Italy's first national war since the Risorgimento. But it also means that Italy's first national war happened to be a colonial war, right? And, and in 1912, at the end of this war, Italy now seized possession over Libya, the three provinces of the Ottoman Empire that had been Libya, as well as the Dodecanese Islands in the Aegean Sea. Now, in the fascist era, after 1922, the first major thrust of uh, Italian expansion in this period was the reconquest of Libya, but I'm going to table that for a second and go back to it. In the mid-30s, in 1935 and 1936, the fascist regime refocused attention on the Eastern Horn of Africa, launching a violent campaign against Ethiopia. Shortly thereafter, the Italian, the Italian possessions in East Africa would be rebranded Italian East Africa or Africa Orientale Italiana. Now, the Ethiopian War is significant because this was actually the first time that a League of Nations member had violated another's sovereignty. Um, this led to Mussolini getting kicked out and the League imposed strong economic sanctions against Italy for this violation of Ethiopian sovereignty, which compelled Mussolini to um, turn to some economic uh, policies of autarky, which is kind of a nice connection to Anna's research from, um, that you heard about a few weeks ago. The Ethiopian campaign was also a huge propaganda coup. Ethiopia was treated like the feather in the cap of Mussolini's fascist empire. It avenged a, a horrible defeat of the Italians in the 1890s. And as you can see from the first two images here, there's this idea that Ethiopia completed the Italian um, fascist empire. Italy finally has its empire in the second, uh, second image in the middle. Right? And, and the Ethiopian campaign was also the subject of many um, fascist films and songs at the period. It was, sort of a heyday of, of uh, a height of nationalist tide. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this is an incredibly brutal war in which Italy deployed chemical and other poison, uh, chemical weapons and poison gas. Just to complete the story really quickly with the final map, and the final push of fascist empire building happened in the first year of World War II, 1939 and 1940, when Italy occupied territories in the Balkans, former Yugoslavia, including Albania. But these would be short lived because after 1943, all of the Italian overseas possessions would be occupied. And shortly thereafter, Italy would sign a peace treaty in 1947 that would force them to concede them. 
So let's um, zoom in now a little bit on Libya, which is the main focus of my research, although the other um, colonies do come up. The fascist reconquest of Libya in the 1920s was incredibly brutal. After World War I, Italy didn't retain much more uh, sovereignty over much more than the coastal towns and it needed to plunge into the desert interior. But here it was faced with um, very fierce and persistent anti-colonial resistance that was led by a variety of, of, of nomadic tribes led by Omar Mukhtar, who would later be nicknamed the Lion of the Desert. This period was marked by concentration camps, which you see in the bottom image, summary executions, mass incarcerations, and torture, as well as mass deportation. Things really took um, a turn in 1929 and 19, between 1929 and 1931, when Mukhtar would be captured. In this short period alone, around 100,000 Libyans were deported into concentration camps and as many as 50,000 people died during this phase of repression. Mukhtar's story culminated in a public execution, um, sort of uh, presided over by Rodolfo Graziani, um, sort of who was a fascist bigwig who was elected vice governor of, of the Eastern part of Libya to oversee this campaign. Um, he also, Graziani also oversaw the construction of the barbed wire border fence between Egypt and Libya. And I actually saw the plans for that in the archives. And that's the image on the bottom right. Mukhtar is um, in chains is the top figure. Some historians, as you'll see in the left image, have branded this period a genocide. Italian imperial historian Angela Bobocca has argued that around one eighth of the Libyan population was exterminated during the colonial era. And hundreds of thousands of Libyans also became exiles, which is a starting point for my research. What happens to them once they are living in exile? After the conquest in the 1930s, Libya actually, like similar to what would happen in Ethiopia, started to loom large in fascist ideology and propaganda. So in the center image, you see a Mussolini during a visit to Libya in 1937, wielding the sword of Islam, which was some kind of weird grandiose bid to woo the, um, the Muslim world away from other, uh, other powers. Right? Also paramount in Italian colonial propaganda and discourse was this notion of propaganda, uh, sorry, progress and civilization. Right, which is pretty typical for um, colonial powers, right? But this, this could be borne out in architecture. So in the bottom right, you actually see the Berenice Theater um, built in Benghazi in 1928 by Marcello uh, Piacentini. So this is a nice, another nice tie into another fellow's work. So David's um, research on Piacentini. And then on the left, I love this postcard because it seems to embody the Italian ethos in Libya, which is the soldiers um, whom colonizers would sort of restore these Libyan lands to its ancient grandeur. You know, note the, um, the fascist, uh, sorry, the ancient columns and the foregrounds. And the message seems clear that empire will be reborn anew and that Libya is an essential part of this new Roman, this new Italian imperial civilization. It's also interesting that in the mid to late thirties, you see a new phase of Italian empire taking place or taking shape in Libya, which was known as demographic colonization. Okay, this is actually part of the same general process of Italy's internal colonization, this process of bonifica or land reclamation that, um, for example, took place in the Pontine marshes, right? So those of you who went to Tali's talk with Mia Fuller know that um, they were talking a lot about the Pontine Marsh project. Similar sort of land reclamation projects are underway in Libya, especially in the late 1930s. In 1938, for example, 20,000 peasants are brought over to Libya. This is a generation known as the Ventimila. And by 1940, there were around 100 or 110,000 uh, Italians living in, in Libya, 40% of whom were agricultural colonists living in settlements like you see here. Um, now, it's again important to underscore that after 1938, these, these possessions were considered part of Italy. In the words of one agricultural settler who was brought at this period, and, and I quote, we aren't emigrating, are we? we're still going home. So Libya is home. But that's sort of, that's, this is sort of the entry point now into the research that I've started to do from the archives. If Libya after 1938 is now formally part of Italy, what does that mean for the character of the Italian nation, and especially for, for norms of Italian citizenship? Citizenship is really the, the theme that I've hit upon from my archival research and has given me a little bit more shape and direction after those first couple of months of archive fever. Now, in the context of national politics, citizenship often has two general meanings. First, there's the question of citizenship as juridical status. And here, legal theorists talk about use sanguinis versus use soli, the idea that citizenship is derived from blood or from soil. 
But citizenship can also connote something more amorphous, lying at the intersection of social and cultural character. It is something that is cultivated through education and civic engagement, and that is absolutely gendered. And I think we all know from um, different examples that there have been throughout modern history very clear examples of what it means to be a good male versus a good female citizen of a given nation or political regime. Both these conceptions of citizenship are operative in my research. So let me give you a very, very quick rundown of sort of how the citizenship regime emerged and evolves in the Italian overseas possessions in the 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s. So first, it was actually very simple. When East Africa were the only, when the, the East African possessions were all that Italy had, there was a clear dichotomy between metropolitan Italian citizenship on one hand and colonial subjecthood on the other hand. But this would actually become much more complicated over time. In 1919, Italy legislated a new sort of intermediary category of citizenship for Libyans. They would update this again in 1927, calling it Cittadinanza Italiana Libica. Italian Libyan citizenship, which was again an intermediary status between metropolitan citizenship and colonial subjecthood. Things would um, continue to evolve as Italy had more possessions, including Albania and other, um, other territories in the Balkans. And there, there really emerged a sort of elaborate patchwork in this Italian colonial citizenship regime. Now, for my purposes, things get really interesting in 1938 and 1939. In 1938, Italy adopted the Nazi racial laws which basically precluded the chance that any colonial citizens could become fully metropolitan citizens, that they could metropolitan citizens, that they could be naturalized. But in 1939, a few months later, Italy again re-legislated Libyan citizenship, creating a new interstitial category known as special Libyan citizenship or special Italian citizenship for Muslim Libyans. Um, and you know, this is a nice jumping off point for me. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that Italy uh, at this time was very much in dialogue with its ancient past, thinking about how um, Roman citizenship had played out and what that might or might not mean for the fascist empire. Now, through my archival research, I've really alighted on four different sort of areas or themes that I'm looking at to build this sort of picture or flesh out this picture of this patchwork citizenship regime under Italian empire. The first is I'm, I'm sort of digging deeper into this notion of special Italian um, citizenship granted to Libyan Muslims in 1938 and 1939. And here I've been focusing a lot recently on this really meaty um, memo that was written by Graziani, the same Italian fascist official who had been um, sort of charged with finally quashing the rebellion in Libya in 1929 through 1931. Okay, so what I'm doing here is trying to use the archival material to peek under the hood and see the internal wrangling and the debates over the variety of categories that Italy was using to demarcate and keep track of and legislate the belonging of different subjects and citizens. Okay, so this is an interesting way to do that. I'm also looking at the experience of the hundreds of thousands of Libyans who fled Italian repression. And here the archives allow us to see the efforts of the Italian government to claim people as Italian, even if they weren't living in the colonial possessions, for example, Libyans living in Egypt. I think there's a wonderful historical irony here that this is an era when Italy, like some other colonial powers I'm seeing, was trying desperately to claim more Africans as their own, more Africans as um, under Italian sovereignty. This raises some interesting questions about how colonial systems um, contribute to nascent understandings of national citizenship, trying to territorialize people whose experience is fundamentally mobile. Then there's two um, quick examples I've just started to think about. I haven't really got into them yet, but I have hopefully some good boxes of material lined up for my next archival visits. One is that I've become very interested in the experience of Libyan Jews who continue to sort of honor and historic connection with Italy that would um, sort of reach its fruition in the late 1960s when you see a small migration of Libyan Jews who had remained in Libya even after the creation of an independent Libyan state to Italy in the 1967-1968. And then I'm also finding interesting looking documents about Libyan students who continue to be invited to Italy um, under state sponsorship, given scholarships to study in Italy. And I'm curious about why this continued to happen even in the 1950s after Italy had ceded its empire. And this speaks more to that second definition of citizenship I was talking about, the idea of molding a certain type of national character through education. Why would Italy still be invested in molding Libyan students and trying to make them more quote unquote Italian? 
So I'm just gonna um, step back and conclude now with some broader thoughts. While the Italian citizenship regime of the fascist era was certainly a racially charged and jur juridically hierarchical one, the research that I've been doing into colonial citizenship in Libya and the question of citizenship for Libyan exiles living in places like Egypt reveals that there were many moving parts and still a degree of flexibility and uncertainty and even maybe political possibility for those living under Italian sovereignty across the empire. In retelling this history, I've tried to argue for a more open and expansive notion of Italianness, one that seems like a far cry from the source of discourse coming from the Quirinale. It is a commonplace fact, of course, that modern nation states as territorially sovereign entities have the authority, sorry, the authority to enforce borders and make determinations about who gets to cross them and remain within them. We know that even for the short time that we are here, we needed to ask the Italian state for his permission. But all this does not mean that states need to be so rigid and absolute in how they imagine the terms of their permissiveness and indeed the bounds of their nationhood. The history of Italian empire and the history of Italian mobilities allows us to see other paths not taken, but that were seriously engaged in not so distant history. So to think through some of this, I'm very much inspired by the writings of Taya Selassie, a British American author um, who lives part-time in Rome. In, in an article she wrote for the New York Times some years ago, she visited Pantelleria, a Mediterranean island, an Italian island, and Lana in the South Tyrolean mountains in the span of 24 hours. And no one that she talked to in either place considered themselves to be Italian. This led her to sort of meditate on the constructed and fluid nature, indeed what she called the lie of nationality. In her words, nationality, however slippery a concept in the context of personal identity, persists in public discourse to justify barriers to citizenship. One was Pantesco, meaning from Pantelleria, when the alternative was Italian. One was Italian when the alternative was Nigerian. And she leaves us with these powerful words. Italy, like any modern nation, and any modern nation like Italy having been imagined, can be reimagined now. And so to wrap up, I'd actually like to try to um, tie Selassie's ideas here to the square Colosseum, maybe a little bit of a, uh, a curveball here, but let me explain. So the square Colosseum, which was built, um, designed by fascists to be the centerpiece of the EUR, but wasn't actually completed until after the war, was another monument to sort of fascist grandeur. And the inscription, which can be read on all sides, tried to sort of capture Mussolini's conception of who the Italians were, and it reads, a people of poets, artists, heroes, saints, thinkers, scientists, navigators, and trans migrants. And here the sort of obscure term trasmigratori was used. Um, trasmigratori is pretty elusive, but I'd like to finish by asking if we can maybe turn Mussolini's word here on its head to represent instead of his own narrow conception of what Italianness might be, something more open and expansive, right? I hope that thinking about um, the history of Italian empire and the history of mobility reminds us that Italian history is the history of Trasmigratori. And I hope that this history reminds us that there have been and will continue to be many ways to be a good Italian citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was really interesting. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting discussions. Very timely in many ways. And I really love the way you've tied it into many people's interests here. So thanks for that. Um, I think we're going to move on now to Steve. Turn it over to you, Steve. Hello. Can everyone hear me and see my screen OK? All right, well, I'm Steve Parker. Welcome to my shop talk. Uh, well, I'm sad to be giving the last obligatory thank you. I don't feel it's obligatory, of course, but um, uh, but yeah, I'm really I'm really feeling sad and melancholy uh, at this time. Uh, but I I would I'm looking forward to the opportunity to expressing my gratitude uh, to the American Academy of Rome. This is the first I, for this lovely studio where you're hearing my resonant voice in the expansive ceiling uh, bouncing around this space. It's the first studio I've had that doesn't have a lawnmower in it, which is very exciting for me. I'm very grateful to all the staff that all the, the challenges they've faced and the way that they've 
helped us to think through different ways of existing as a community. I'm also really grateful to my fellows, fellow fellows and um, fellow travelers. Um, really grateful to all of you for your generosity, your friendship, uh, the conversations that we've had. I'm gonna be really sad to say goodbye to all of you in uh, just a few weeks. Um, and then finally, um, thank you to my family. Thank you, Molly and Elliot, for coming with me to Rome, for pausing your lives in Austin and coming on this adventure with me. Um, so I wanted to start out by just giving you kind of an overview of some of the things that I do, some general themes of my work. Uh, my work centers on listening and, and engaging people in sort of new ways of thinking about listening. Um, to do this, I often utilize multi-sensory objects, meaning objects that have a visual, a tactile, and of course, a sonic component. And with these objects, I think of them as a way to facilitate performances with people, so creating compositions uh, or uh, performances with, with these objects. Um, in particular, when I'm, I'm creating objects, I often work with found and salvaged materials, often gravitating towards uh, reclaimed um, and junked uh, marching band instruments. Um, I really enjoy working with the public in a lot of these projects uh, in creating these sorts of large-scale civic rituals. Uh, to this end, I've, I've worked with all sorts of people, including uh, truck drivers, pedicab drivers, um, professional birders and beekeepers and flocks of grackles and even uh, bats, bat colonies, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, my work draws from a variety of, of histories and legacies um, and often obscure ones. And then finally, um, workshops are a big part of the process in which I work, uh, working closely with the public, sharing some of my skills, uh, some of my background and experience and also uh, generating an exchange of ideas um, and experimentation with everyone involved. Um, but today, I wanted to focus primarily just on the practice of listening and how listening itself can be an expressive act. Um, I'm also really interested in the tension between uh, the history of listening in conflict and in warfare, um, how it's been used in sinister means, um, but then also in the ways that it can be used as a tool for compassion and empathy and self-care. Um, and this, of course, is drawing largely from the practice of deep listening, uh, which was developed by the composer, American composer, Pauline Oliveros. But I also, again, like to think of this as uh, taking deep listening and um, viewing it through a performative lens, such that um, when people are engaged in this act of listening, they become expressive performers who are then viewed by other performers who then become the focal point of the work that's being created, not necessarily object. Um, so the first uh, piece I wanted to show you is a piece called Batman. It's a piece, if you haven't been to Austin before, um, Austin is home to the largest urban bat colony in the world. They live under the Congress Street Bridge. And this is a performance for um, 1.5 million bats, uh, pitch shifted bat calls, uh, and a community megaphone choir, a conch shell ensemble, um, a funnel garden hose ensemble, um, and then audience members who are also engaged as performers, um, some of which who were uh, equipped with handmade echolocation devices. These, were, these are called sondals that were uh, developed in the mid 20th century uh, for people who were visually impaired so they could navigate space using sound, um, sonar. And uh, most famously, it was used uh, by Alvin Lussier in his uh, piece, Vespers. Um, but all of those materials aside, this piece is really about how living things use sound and listening to navigate physical space and also to navigate memory in a certain way. And it was a, it was a personal piece for me because it was a piece that was dedicated to the, the memory of uh, a good friend of mine who died suddenly and a lot of the conversations we had about those topics of uh, navigating space and memory with sound and and a lot of it contains quotes of some of his music as well he's a composer um, so I want to just uh, share a couple clips of this with you
there isn't really time to show you the end of that right now, but uh, it does culminate with um, this uh, uh, evening um, of, I don't know how to describe it, this, uh, the, the bats leaving their, their home base under the, the, the bridge and, and flying out. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that get, is sort of like an evening ritual in Austin and, and hundreds of people view it every night. It's uh, very beautiful if you ever find yourself in Austin during the summer months. Um, so aside from live performances, I'm, I've been more interested lately in creating objects that facilitate these sorts of performances that uh, faci facilitate listening experiences with people. Um, this is uh, an exhibition called War Tuba Recital. Um, the title itself is a reference to the work of uh, Terry Adkins, who was a sculptor and musician who uh, conceived of his exhibitions as uh, a form of recital and abstract portraiture of, uh, and, and he also thought about how um, his sculptures functioned both as compositions and also physical objects. Um, so this exhibition is largely about the history of listening in conflict um, and thinking about transforming that, that goal. Um, this first work that I'm showing you is called Ghost Box. It's a piece that is played by two people wearing headphones. They alone hear uh, the sound that is generated by the sculpture. Um, the form of the sculpture is modeled after the schematic drawing of a shortwave radio from World War II. And when you touch different parts of the brass parts of the sculpture, these trigger different audio clips of coded transmissions ranging from uh, clips of the shofar uh, to jamming signals of uh, communist China and Russia to um, songs of the Underground Railroad and Morse code. Um, and this is how it works. is only a test. So taking a closer look at the sculpture, um, there are a series of abstract um, graphic scores embedded into the sculpture itself. Um, here's another detailed view of these scores. Um, and these scores are taking and abstracting icons and drawings of fictional maps that were created by the Ghost Army. Um, you're looking at some of these maps. Um, and the Ghost Army was a classified division of allied forces during World War II um, that was made up of artists and designers. Um, and they were tasked with fooling the enemy and uh, pretending, impersonating to be a larger uh, group of soldiers than they actually were. Uh, in these photos, you can see there's on the upper right-hand corner an uh, inflatable rubber tank. On the left side is a fake radio station. Down below, there are a series of elaborate, um, almost like sound art machines that uh, projected field recordings of soldiers doing soldier things and pretending to be uh, a larger uh, group of soldiers than they actually were. Um, another uh, sculpture from the War Tuber recital is a sculpture called Sirens. Um, this is a sculpture that um, sort of revi revisits the, the form of the um, air raid siren and uh, reimagines it as a tool for amplifying voices and a, a tool to amplify these voices to new listeners. Um, it projects uh, voices of displaced uh, people who are, um, who have, uh, or the, uh, song, singing songs of distress. Um, and here's a quick clip of this.
And finally, um, this is the last uh, piece I'm going to show you from War Tuba Recital is uh, a piece. Uh, this is actually a wearable war tuba. Um, this is a device that was uh, takes inspiration from these um, sort of wearable ear trumpets that were used to uh, listen to the skies in World War II before radar was invented. Um, and these, this is reimagined as a, uh, a wearable sculpture that is used to realize a composition um, made from clips of ASMR. Uh, ASMR is um, used among other things to treat insomnia um, and PTSD and um, here's a clip of this. This is another sculpture um, called a tubascope. It's uh, a public art sculpture that employs a similar concept. Um, it's intended to be, uh, in a way, a, a telescope for your ears. Um, you simply put your ear up to the trumpet bell at the base of the sculpture, um, which is connected to a series of copper pipes, which are connected to the sousaphone sculptures up above. Um, and these sousaphone sculptures are gathering, amplifying, and harmonizing, subtly harmonizing, uh, the soundscape that's all around us. And it's, in a, in a way, a, a sort of picture frame for the soundscape. Um, this work is augmented with a series of illustrated listening games or exercises for the public uh, to engage them in new ways of listening, and also provide some background info on the project. And this is, here are some other, I always enjoy any excuse excuse me, to, to show more images of these acoustic locators. These are more examples of um, uh, these devices uh, pre-radar that were used to listen to the skies. Um, I just want to show you a few uh, other examples of recent listening devices I've been working on. Um, this is a piece called Kyrie. It's made up of organ pipes and copper pipes. It's operated by up to seven people who use fireplace bellows at the base of the sculpture. Um, this is a mural that functions like a theremin. You simply uh, move your hands across the colored discs on the wall, which trigger different sound clips. Um, this is Stro door. It's um, a reclaimed oak door uh, that has piano wire uh, or music wire that's strung up along the length of the door. Uh, the door itself is amplified, and the signal of the door is sent to the Stro violins that are mounted on the wall. These are defunct instruments that were once used before, um, well, in the early days of radio. And um, now I want to say a few words about uh, our upcoming concert that I'm doing with um, Bill, Katie, and Ted, and show you a few pieces. Uh, from it, and then also invite all of you to uh, take part in it in a certain way. Um, so uh, the first piece I'm going to show you is a piece called Death Rattle. Um, this is a piece of um, that is comprised of different cardboard works uh, of body parts, and inside these body parts are speakers, and these speakers are projecting the sounds of body processes. Um, the sounds that we listen to, the type of listening that we do at the end of life and at the beginning of life. So sort of the, the intimacy of that, um, the fragility of those sounds. Um, this next picture is courtesy of Lynn Lancaster. You may recognize a few of these people. Um, this is a piece called Human Stylus, and this is a wearable device that essentially turns a person into a record player, into a phonograph. 
Um, so these long poles are dragged along surfaces of the ground, um, amplifying the changes in texture and pattern. Here's an example. This is a theremin, another type of theremin uh, that sort of promotes a, a sort of performance as you enter, as the performer or the viewer enters into this space, uh, into this three-dimensional space, and it, it reacts to uh, location. This is a piece called Sanctus. It's uh, intended to be a sanctuary for people and for birds. Um, you may know it is located nearby uh, the legendary fort created by some of the junior members of the American Academy in Rome. Um, this is a piece that uh, projects the chant of Hildegard von Bingen, who is a 13th century abbess who, among other things, believed strongly in the potential for sound to have healing qualities. So it projects um, the, the chants of this uh, of Hildegard's music onto these, out of these trump, trumpet bells and onto these parabolic dishes. And also it employs uh, smaller bird-sized versions of these acoustic locators that you're seeing here, sorry, acoustic sound mirrors that you're seeing here. Um, and these are both reflecting sound in a way um, and then also functioning as bird feeders and bird baths. Um, this is a mattress that was found uh, by Kati behind um, the Bass Garden. Um, and this is a piece that sort of um, encourages the viewer to listen to the sonic potential of objects, uses feedback. And lastly, uh, this is a wearable device um, that is uh, sort of a riff off of pendulum music, if you're familiar with that piece by Steve Reich. And it's a, a wearable device that responds to the user's gait. It's a kind of a sonic hat. So I'm going to probably be reaching out to a number of you um, in the coming days about possibly being involved in our project uh, with some of these devices. Um, at this point, I would like to pass the baton over to Kyle, who's going to lead us in a special uh, Cooking with Kyle edition. Um, so please uh, turn on your microphones and your videos, if you don't <laughs> mind. Kyle, are you there? <laughs> Make us dinner, too. There we go. <laughs> so we're going to do a recipe tonight. So everyone should have gotten some paper, some newspaper, dropped off by Steve, and a bag of pop rocks. <laughs> so I'm going to walk you through the motions that everyone's going to be doing. Um, so after I after I take them through, we're all going to in unison do these motions and do these these noises together. So the first thing, the first move is going to be rubbing the newspaper. The second move will be crumpling the newspaper into. A Third move is going to be reading reading an article out loud from the paper that you have. Oh, oh sorry, I missed one. Uh, the third move, actually, before after we crumple, we're going to paper. Okay. 
How, how are we going to read the article if we've already ripped it? We'll be read an article out loud in the paper. <laughs> and, then our la and then lastly, we're all going to open the Pop Rocks, take some of the Pop Rocks in your mouth, and then slowly, getting closer to the microphone on your uh, computer, open and close your mouth while the Pop Rocks are doing their thing. So. Oh, no, if, oh, I, could, I, if I could just add one thing, make sure you save one page of the newspaper uh, before you mutilate it for the last, uh, for the last reading part. Okay, so we can start now. We don't have to be in unison, but you go. Sorry. <laughs> Una serie di attacchi terroristici che hanno avuto un caos convergenza alla Casa Bianca con i servizi internazionali di sicurezza sotto assedio. Thriller politico denso di adrenalina e scena. Questa è la trama di State Terror, nato a un calabro la visione prestigiosa e inaspettata fra Hillary Clinton e Louise Penny, autrice canadese e regina del mondo. Due autrici bestseller per il romanzo di Nascirà il prossimo 18 ottobre e contemporanea sia negli Stati Uniti che in Italia, qua in stile libro. Nasce da un'amicizia di vecchia data, Lex First Lady, che fa le sue biografie. È una dei grandi fan di Louis Penny. A segue la pubblicazione di Still Life, il primo giallo della serie ambiente di New York. Il ispettore Ormand Gamache. Un'ammirazione ricambiata che si è consolidata negli anni e ha fatto nascere la idea di cultura letteraria condivisa. Ho accettato con entusiasmo di scrivere una storia di quattro anni. Ha commentato. Dopo che già nel 2008 il marito aveva firmato a sua volta un thriller con James Patterson, mette di più in mente dei grafici presenti nel plot. Ho fatto tesoro della mia esperienza per raccontare il mondo complesso della politica. La protagonista di Stan Terror è infatti una donna segretaristica. Entrata a fare parte della mia frattura del suo rivale. Lo tanto però il tempo dovrà costituire una task force per combattere e sconfiggere la cospirazione terroristica. Siamo a di equilibrio mondiale. La gloria è la fama grandissima, onore universale. Che si acquista per la terra di tornare a distruggere eccezionali. Ha dovuto fare per opere in fine. Fare punto che il primo gentone nell'edizione 2021 è arrivato contro il Braga nella andata del Sedditini. Come posso aprire questo Pop-Rox? Let's hear the pop rocks, everyone. They don't taste good. <laughs> Grazie, Steve.
Those taste terrible. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. I was given the job of being maestro and ending the. Oh, you like them, Lindsay? Okay, cool. Um, I have an extra bag for you. <laughs> I think I got a bag for two. Um, well, all. thank you. I can't imagine a more fun way to uh, wrap up our shop talks, if not the most delicious. Well, maybe the most delicious we've had. Um, I defy you to bring them and put them in your Prosecco tonight. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But before we get to the fun part, we um, should um, certainly spend some time with a few questions for our speakers. Um, I. I, I'm, I'm curious to see how people bring these together. If they do, it's not necessary, but I thought, of course, you know, I'm look, thinking at World War II and looking at these materials that you're both thinking about um, more conceptually, maybe how you are both flipping our assumptions about the things you work on through close reading or close listening and close attention. I'm sure other people have other ideas that they will um, post in the questions, but. Another thing I thought that brought you together was Hannah. Hannah, <laughs> Hannah being a human stylist. I really love those pictures. So um, we do have some hands up. So let me see. I'm not actually sure who was first, but I'm just going to start with Anna um, because she's the first on my screen. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for these wonderful talks. Um, I, I have a question sort of for both of you, I guess, um, in different ways. And I think for Matthew, it's a question about, it, so it's a question about sort of like replication and violence and how you kind of tell the stories of um, really difficult things in both of your work. And I, I think for Matthew, it's like a question that I think about all the time um, in the archives that we share about, you know, the, the kind of story that we're trying to tell about fascism and about the kind of violence that you talk about in your talk and how you methodologically deal with, um, you know, the using these official documents to tell um, a story about Libyans that, you know, in which like their experiences of those events might be difficult to find. Um, and I think for Steve, it's a question about the replication of like difficult sound. Um, and, you know, in your works that deal with war in particular, the kind of, um, I had a real reaction to the kind of like distress calls um, in the work. And I, I just wonder how you think about the kind of replication of violent sound or of sounds of war um, and, yeah, how you think about the kind of effect of that on the viewer and what what you want to replicate and what you want to sort of um, use to provoke like a critical response and then what you think about protecting your viewer from or, or where there's gentleness in the work. So yeah, thanks. So yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's interesting. Um, I guess I would answer in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, and I'm, as you know, in some ways, Italian historiography makes it easy because there's so much amnesia and so much of the willful suppression of the imperial past that any kind of telling feels worthy, feels worthwhile and, and worth undertaking, right? So the more stories we have from the archives, like I'm not usually so um, just kind of empirical, but just finding stuff and putting it out there in the public domain already feels like a feat and something worth doing to speak back to a sort of forgotten history of violence. But I should also say that, you know, that's not my main topic. I, th I thought it was, it was, it would have been irresponsible to talk about colonial Libya without talking about the violence, but I'm really starting to be more interested in this late thirties moments and not to put to, you know, put it in too rosy a light, but it seems like the citizenship regime is an avenue for us to rethink, um, to, to think about different kinds of things, different kinds of processes that work in colonialism. So to move away from violence a little bit, to talk about new possibilities and new kinds of connectivity. Um, and I, I don't know, I think that's also worth doing, right? To, to sort of side by side with the violence. And then of course, be ruthless in how you treat some of these colonial officials like Graziani, who do not de deserve the accolades that they've been given. 
I mean, for example, Graziani was recently feted, you know, they built a, a mausoleum for him in a town east of Rome with 160,000 euros of um, Lazio public funds, right? So the more kinds of histories we tell about this period, I think the, you know, the more that we can challenge some of that political project as well. Thanks for your question, Anna. I'm gonna be brief because I think, um, I, I think I took up more of the Q&A time than intended uh, with that uh, little um, Pop Rocks piece. But um, I don't know that um, I'm interested so much in, in replicating the sounds of warfare so much as thinking about um, the idea of transformation um, in a lot of these works and thinking about how these tools can be transformed um, in function in different ways. And then also the materials themselves, how they can be transformed, especially thinking about like marching bands and their historical connection to warfare, to, um, uh, as, and as sonic weapons as a sort of, and, and they continue to be used as a, as a, a way to um, intimidate um, and thinking about how uh, these, these materials and also these tools in a, in a broader sense can be used to facilitate um, catharsis. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, next I think was Corina. From, where are you Corina, Paris? Yes, I'm very, I am in Paris. I'm sorry that I couldn't perform. <laughs> I don't have any newspaper with me and the Pop Rocks are, contains milk, so I'm allergic to <laughs> But <laughs> I really enjoyed the performance that you had. Um, thank you both because it was amazing. But my question is more for Steve and I think it's more technical. Um, can you say something more about, I mean, do you in some way um, manipulate the sound that you obtain with your sculptures uh, in terms of composition, in terms of music, uh, or you let that completely free uh, to the person that wear or perform the instrument, let's say that you use? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So uh, just to clarify, you're asking me, um, am I, could you, could you ask the, the end of that question one more time? So if, you I, use, if you manipulate the sound that you obtain, I mean, um, when, for example, the feedback uh, with the mat, um, do you manipulate in some way the feedback uh, or not? Or it's completely free, it's completely physical also. Or uh, for example, in other sculptures, the installation, do you in some way uh, manipulate the sound that you obtain in order to have a more beautiful sound? Or in, I mean, in, more in a, in a musical way. I, I don't know if I am explaining myself well, but like more in that, that field, the music and not only music like a sound. Maybe not, I'm just interested in that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I don't actually, I mean, I appreciate the, um, the uh, Elizabeth introducing me as a composer. I don't really think of myself so much as a composer, more of like a, a form of like a sculptor of sound or a sculptor of, of people, a uh, sculptor of performances. Um, I'm also not trained as a composer in any way. So um, I also, think that there's, I, I'm more interested in um, kind of pointing a finger at sounds or framing them rather than, uh, and, and allowing and sort of elevating those sounds or elevating messages that need to be elevated and amplified in certain ways. Sometimes it does involve a little bit of manipulation, but uh, I, I tend to do as, as little as possible because I think it's, for the type of work that I'm doing, it's more honest. And it's also, there's, I don't need to do a lot yeah. to make it more musical. Like for, with the, with the mattress, for example, that's just feedback. That's the natural, natural mm -hmm. resonance of the object. And it's in a, a way of listening to the object and listening to its expressive potential rather than like what I have to say about it. Um, same for like those bat calls. Um, if you slow down bat calls, um, they're very melodic, and they're, they're actually not just sonar. They're, they're, they're both um, social calls, like birds. Uh, and if you slow them down, um, they, they sound like melodies. Um, so my goal is to really um, to, to, to frame things rather yeah. than to add too much of my voice into it, because I think there's, a, there's tons to be said already without my voice being a part of any of it.
Thank, Thank you. you. Amazing. I'm your fan. You know that. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and, and thanks for that correction actually because that actually helps me think about your work um, I, I could have intuited that but it, it's really helpful no I mean um, it's like I'm, I'm not yeah. uh, it's very nice exactly. of you to say but I also I mean I think there are composers in present company that are much more <laughs> far far more skilled than I am in it's the, like actually the a great art of out. composition yeah, it seems like a great um, start to a further conversation. Um, but I want to move on because there are a lot of questions uh, to Maggie and company. Um, well, if it's okay, Toby has a question for Steve and I have a question for, for Matt. So Toby, okay. do you want to ask a question to Steve really quickly? So like, why did we do the pop locks in the newspaper thing? Okay. That's and a good question. The piece is about making noise and listening to noise and sort of the ways that we listen to uh, how we consume information. So, and, and also taking ways in which information is transmitted and turning them into noise. Um, so um, I don't know if, I don't know how this would relate to you, Toby, so much, um, but if you're thinking about, I, it's kind of like make, it's like turning on 30 different radio stations all at once or um, just you don't have a phone yet luckily but if you do and when you do you'll notice that you're constantly flooded a, what's that i'm never gonna get a phone <laughs> good for you uh but if, if if you ever have a device of some kind you'll notice that you're like constantly flooded with information and the piece is all about these different types of noises um, and then the the pop rocks are another way of like producing this white noise or noise in general is like this like static sound so they're all like different ways of making noise um, and then the whole piece in a way is a, a form of um, it's kind of in a way a, a religious ritual like I don't know if you've ever been to a Catholic church before but you take a wafer um, at the at, at a certain point in, in the uh, and so the the pop rocks are mimicking that in a way and all of this is sort of like a ritual action that we do together and sometimes when we do things together um, it makes us feel better. Thank you. Um, can I, so my question- I do now, have a computer. Uh, okay, can you go shower? No. Well, my question for Matt, oh, you can listen to my question. Okay, my question for Matt is, so Matt, um, I was um, really interested, uh, as you know, by this idea of how uh, we imagine nations or communities um, or kind of relationships with people that we will never get to know in person. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you, um, or whether you're going to sort of move outside the archive or how you to consider um, the other, the means by which people are sort of living their imagined communities on a daily basis, whether that be technology to think of Steve or music or um, popular culture and how um, you're sort of translating uh, your archival research into this um, sort of rich tapestry of what makes up this more amorphous concept of citizenship and how people feel or imagine belonging to it? It's a great question. And, you know, what I always say with, with empires that no one ever imagines they're going to fall. They're built to endure, right? And so absolutely, the Italian state was very interested in incorporating sort of technological means of communicating to all of its citizens and subjects. And so in the archive, we've become very interested in some of the files from the Ministry of Popular Culture. I've been collecting some documents about radio. There was actually a nascent radio station in Tripoli, and then they had people listening to Egyptian radio and Tunisian radio. So yeah, I'm absolutely interested in sort of um, cultural mediation of Italianness, right? So yeah, not just political governance, but the different means by which Italianness is being sort of fostered and channeled um, into the possessions. Absolutely. So yeah, my, my answer is, is yes. <laughs> I love that there's a ministry of pop culture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Maggie. Um, so I'm just mindful of time and just um, asking you to be concise in your questions. Uh, of course, we can carry them over into a uh, in-person gathering tonight. But um, let's see. Uh, Tali, I think you are next in line. Thank from you. North Carolina, maybe we're very interested. Yeah, I'm in North Carolina, but thank you both very, very much. I guess I would say that to me, the the 
connecting line between these two wonderful presentations was kind of the ephemeral nature of existence and um, both kind of catching sounds that get lost and making something of them and, and hearing things, as you say, that disappear, but also thinking particularly of my question, which is for Matt, do you think that nationalism can exist without archives? This is kind of the backside of what Maggie just asked, but with the mobility questions that you were bringing out, I mean, what kind of nationalism was this? Can it exist without archives and censuses and the like? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really hard question to answer. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think the answer is no. I, th I think that, you know, the way that I like to see history is that, or at least modern history, when the world is sort of moving away from more amorphous territorial identities like empires into a world of nation states, so modern history is sort of an ongoing battle between territoriality and mobility, right? So you have political state, uh, states that are trying to lock people into place, lock identities into place, but then the reality is that humans move. They always have and they always will. And so the archives though, they are the handmaiden of territorialism, right? That kind of impulsive state making that wants to lock people into place. But I guess, and maybe this is a better way to answer what Anna was asking. I, when I go to archives, I try to read my materials against the grain and to listen, you know, to take um, Steve's example, to listen for what you don't always, you know, hear at the, you know, um, at the outset, right? And so if you read, you know, and of course it's problematic and there are many philosophers and theorists of history who talk about what you can and cannot get from state official archives, but I do believe that you can read colonial archives and state archives against the grain and recapture voices of mobility and recapture experiences of mobility. But yes, you have to read them you have to read them um, carefully and critically. Thank you. That was an interesting question. Um, Alex. Hi, I, I mean, just what a high note to end shop talks on. That was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of more inclusive modes of listening and remembering and, and sort of hearing voices that got unheard. Um, I, I want to keep it concise. So I just wanted to ask Steve if he would talk a little bit more about how some of um, your artworks are um, interactions with or interventions with non-human um, organisms, um, because I'm fascinated by the bat piece, for example, that's my favorite thing about Austin. And at the same time, I'm also aware of studies that talk about how noise pollution has an impact on biodiversity. And I'm wondering if there are um, sonic interventions that would help mend that or help create a better relationship between humans and the non-human. Um, how do you think about that relationship? Yeah, it's a great question. I am not an expert in any of these things, um, but I often work with people who are experts. Um, so, and in the work that I'm doing about it, I'm less concerned with creating something that kind of fixes, fixes the situation. I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. Um, I think that's far beyond my abilities, but um, the another way of like a primary goal of in these sorts of performances. I did another project related to the grackle as well. That was a sort of multimedia birding excursion um, where birders led people around to different roosting locations of the great tailed grackle and talked about how our built environment affects these species, which are considered to be a nuisance, but they're really a nuisance because of us and the, the built environments that we create. So a lot of these projects are not so much about, and also I should say, because sometimes this has come up and it's a valid question. Um, I, I always consult with people like Bat Conservation International or Tra Travis Audubon Society uh, for those projects so that these projects are not harassing <laughs> the animals, which is a valid, very valid concern. Um, but there, it's, it's more about telling a story and communicating the situation to a broader public, both in the form of the performance, but then more importantly, and I think there's a more there's more of a stickiness in the process leading up to it, where we do these series of workshops that provide points of entry into aspects of uh, these species and um, information about them or how to uh, experience or appreciate them or different sort of tangential uh, areas of exploration that are connected to this broader idea of being uh, stewards of the environment and, and thinking about 
our role and how we're contributing um, to this, this sphere. Thank you for the question, really excellent. Mm -hmm. Great, and uh, I thought we had two more questions, but we lost one. So uh, Becky, it's over to you. Okay, thank, I'll try to be fast. Um, one thing that, thank you both for your wonderful talks. Um, one thing that jumped out to me um, in both of your talks was the idea of being able to see people's faces and uh, what changes when those are obscured and sort of like the power of the visage because right now we're living in a moment where that's less true. Um, so. For Matt, um, my question had to do with the fact that when I moved here from Greece, all Greek people know this Italian expression, la stessa faccia, la stessa razza, like that they're the same, they perceive themselves to be the same race because they're both self-identified diaspora populations, the Greeks and the Italians, but of course they are diaspora in a way that they consider acceptable to each other. Um, and. I was wondering if that expression maybe comes in, in opposition to the, the groups that you think about or, or what that, um, how that differs from the work that you're doing. And then um, in Steve's case, I was really in awe of your, your BAT um, event. And then I was, I was wondering if people seem to be sort of more liberated when they were making the noises because perhaps because they had the instrument over their face. So do you, do you experience like a change in your participants when they feel somewhat anonymized by, by their participation? So I can start and answer it quickly. First of all, I didn't know that expression, but it's really wonderful. And I think it actually embodies a lot of what I'm talking about because I think, you know, with notions of race or nationality or citizenship, what I think the historical lens allows us to see is that the, the, the lines are always drawn arbitrarily. They might not seem like they are, but they are, right? So why stop at Greece, right? If there's, there's so many people whose experience of nationhood or has, has been forced through diaspora and mobility. And, you know, in, in Italy, of course, you know, you have large Albanian populations and Sicily is a melting pot of many different kinds of peoples. And, and so, I would just say that I, I love that and I think it really affirms what I'm trying to do with all of this, but is to, to point out the arbitrariness of the lines that we draw between people when there's actually so much we have in common when we think about um, history in the long array. Excellent question. Um, I will say that I just, I love working with uh, untrained musicians um, and it's because of the way that there's a palpable electricity and working with people who are not used to being the center of attention, especially in a performative space. Um, and that's the primary reason why I like working with, with people who aren't necessarily professional musicians, but they, um, I'm really interested in the idea of like the everyday virtuosity of all kinds of people. I'm also um, really interested in, in how uh, this sort of performance can be a transformative, have a transformative effect on people. And then also it brings into this, this uh, additional um, element of aleatoric chance, um, unpredictability uh, that you don't get. I mean, you kind of know what you're gonna get when you, you write a piece of music for a trained performer. I mean, it's like, oh, it, there's some variation, but it's a pretty narrow with, with untrained musicians or people who are uh, not incredible, don't, follow instructions. I mean, it's like, it's super exciting. Um, so yeah, it's great. Thank you for your question. Thank you, everyone. Well, um, I have the real honor of wrapping us up. So I have three things to say. The first is thanks again to our speakers, but to each and every one of you for the wonderful talks you've given this year and the wonderful feedback you've given each other. It's really been inspiring. You are smart, you are dedicated, and you are generous beyond words. So I'm, I think we're all grateful to each other for all of that. Um, I also want to just, I want to quote Tali. I love what she said. And I think for me, um, it sums up a lot of what I've taken away from you all up to this point, And there's still more, which is um, to listen for what is usually unheard. I think we heard that from the archives. We heard it from music, but we've heard it from all of you, I think, in so many ways. So um, Tali, thank you for giving me that um, way of sort of thinking about everything we're doing. And third, to quote my friend Lynn Lancaster, and this time for real, buon appetito, and she'll see you for Prosecco. I wish you could all be here, but we'll be toasting every one of you in spirit. Thanks, everyone.